Hi. In this video, we're going to take a closer look at the hypothesis test for independence. In this test, we're going to be looking at two different variables and trying to determine whether or not there's a relationship between these two variables or whether they're completely independent from one another. Let's take a closer look. If we're going to conduct a hypothesis test for independence, we have the same requirements that we do for the goodness of fit test. We should use data taken from a simple random sample. The expected value for each category should be at least five. And our test statistic is the chi-square test statistic, which is defined uh, in the same way. We take the sum of observed minus expected values squared divided by their expected value, and we add that up for each category. Let's look at an example. <clears throat> so the question we want to answer here is whether or not a graduate's starting salary is related in some way to his or her college major, or are starting salary and college major independent. So we're going to use the 0.05 level of significance and the following data to test whether or not these two variables are independent. So we use what are called contingency tables here. So we have some various college majors uh, listed as rows, and then we have uh, three categories of starting salary heading our columns, and this is our sample data. So this is our observed uh, data contingency table. And what we're going to do is we're going to compare that to another table of the expected values. So the first thing that happens is we compute the expected value for each one of these cells uh, under the condition that these two variables are independent. So the way we do that, I'll just show you one example. Let's say I wanted to compute the expected value for this cell meaning engineering majors who received a starting salary between $50,000 and $68,999. To compute the expected value, what we do is we take the column total multiplied by the row total divided by the sample size, so divided by n. So to find n, we just add up every single value in this table. This is from a random sample of 300 people, so that's n. And then we take the column total. So for this particular cell, I would want the column total uh, for this middle column, which is 115. And then I would multiply by the total for this second row, which is 100. And if I take 115 times 100, divided by 300, I get approximately 38.3. So the expected number of people who should fall into this category, if we have the assumption that college major and starting salary are independent, uh, the expected number in this category would be 38 and a third. Okay? So what you would do is calculate this for every single cell. Uh, your calculator, when we do this test, is actually going to calculate all these values for you. So you do not need to do these all by hand. But I'll go ahead and fill these in for you. So here are the rest of the expected values. And what this test for independence will do is compare uh, the two contingency tables. And, you know, they're clearly a bit different. And what we're trying to do is weigh whether or not this difference can be attributed to random chance or if there's something more significant than that. Uh, going on here. Okay, so when we do the test for independence, your null hypothesis is always going to be that the two variables are independent. So our null hypothesis would be that starting salaries are independent of a person's college major. Your alternate hypothesis for a test for independence is that, uh, in this case, starting salaries are dependent on what a student majored in in college. Okay, so when you do a test for independence, this is the way your hypotheses work. And now we're going to go ahead and bring up the calculator and see what we get. So here's what we do. We're not going to go to stat first. Uh, for this test, we need to first uh, go to the matrix menu. So you should see matrix uh, above the button that says x to the minus one power over here on the left hand side. So to get that, we're going to have to press second and then press that button to bring up the matrix menu. And we're going to go over to edit and we're going to edit 
the first matrix, matrix A. Okay, so the first thing to do is enter how many rows and columns uh, your matrix has, not including uh, column and row headings. So if we look at our observed data here, there are five rows that have numerical entries and there are three columns. So I'm going to make this a five by three matrix. So go ahead and make that uh, five by three, press enter, and it will give you a five by three matrix. And we are going to fill in all of the observed values. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Uh, just press the value and then press enter and it will take you to the next cell and keep going until you are done. Okay, so I have all of my data entered into the matrix. Then I'm going to press stat. I'm going to go over to tests and we want the chi-square test. It should be listed just above the chi-square goodness of fit test, but we're not using that one. We are using just the chi-square test. And if you press enter, it is going to ask you which matrix you put your observed data in. And mine was matrix A. If you put your observed data into a different matrix, or if this doesn't say A, if it says something else, you will need to change this to the correct matrix. Uh, to change this, you're going to press second and press that matrix button again, and then you'll just go down and select whatever matrix you want. Okay? Expected, you can put any matrix here you want except the one that you put for observe because what it is going to do is fill in the expected matrix for you. Okay, so B here is just fine. I'm going to go down to calculate and see what it gives me. It gives me the chi-square statistic of 33.5 and it gives me a p-value of 4.9 times 10 to the minus fifth power. So we have a very small p-value that's definitely less than alpha. Alpha was 0 0.05 in this case. And since my p-value is smaller, we are going to reject the null. And our null hypothesis is that starting salary and college major are independent. So we have found significant evidence to reject that idea. So our conclusion is that salaries are somewhat dependent on a student's college major. So there is sufficient evidence that starting salaries are dependent on a person's college major. Now that doesn't mean starting salaries don't depend on a lot of other things as well, and we don't know the degree to which they're dependent on strictly what somebody majored in college. But uh, we have statistical evidence that there is a relationship between what a student majors in and what kind of starting salary they receive. So they're definitely not independent uh, based on our test. Okay. Let's look at one other example real quick. Uh, here's a drug, uh, drug trial, and researchers set out to determine, among other things, whether either of the leading drugs for treating migraines is more likely to cause abdominal pain as one of its side effects. So if someone is talking to their doctor and experiencing a lot of migraines, uh, and they might be concerned about this side effect, we want to know if any of these are better than another, or if abdominal pain is independent of what drug we choose. Okay, so we have a data taken from a random sample of participants below. Um, I just made up these drug names, Mygon and Quick Relief, uh, and then typically we have a placebo group as well. So uh, our participants were broken up into these three groups, and then some of them experienced abdominal pain after taking the drug, and some did not we're going to use the 0.01 level of significance to determine if one of these drugs are more likely to cause abdominal pain. So our null hypothesis is that uh, abdominal pain is independent of which drug we choose. Okay, And our alternate hypothesis is that there's some dependence here. So one of these drugs is more likely uh, than the other to result in abdominal pain. Okay. So as we did in the last example, our first step is to fill in our matrix. So go to second, uh, open up the matrix menu, and we can edit the one we just used, or you can go down and pick another one. That's just up to you. Uh, if you feel like you're going to want to look at these again, um, you can leave those alone. But I usually just use matrix A every time. So I'm going to edit that. Uh, I have to change the dimensions here because I only have two rows and three columns. So I'm going to change this to a 2 by 3 matrix. And I am going to then fill in uh, the values. Okay. 
And once I fill these in, I'm going to go to Stat. I'm going to go over to Tests. And I'm going to go down to the Chi-Square test, which again is choice capital C. And I want this to look the same. I put my observed data in matrix A again. If you put it somewhere else, change that. I want it to put the expected values in matrix B. There's nothing wrong with that. And I'm going to go down to Calculate. And here I get a Chi-Square statistic of 2.07 and a p-value of 0.355. Okay, In this example my p-value is greater than alpha so I do not reject the null. I do not have enough evidence to reject the null here so my conclusion would be that abdominal pain is likely independent of the choice of drug. Okay, And you know because we included a placebo group, placebo group here and we didn't see much difference even with the inclusion of a placebo group uh, then it's it's likely that neither one of these drugs is more likely to cause abdominal pain than not taking a drug at all so uh, to suggest one of these drugs causes abdominal pain uh, that's not a likely scenario uh, based on our test uh, something I forgot to show you in the previous example if you go back to the matrix menu now and press second if you go down to matrix B, it populates matrix B with the expected values in case you were curious about that. So I just selected matrix B and if I press enter here, these are the expected counts uh, that we would see in a contingency table if these were in fact independent. And notice the ones you can see on the screen here, they're pretty similar to our observed data which is why we got the conclusion that we did. But if you do want to see those expected counts, uh, you can go back and look in that second matrix you selected and the expected counts should be there. Okay, so that's just a couple examples of how a test for independence works.